you have your Bible with you, you can turn again to Luke chapter 7. Luke chapter 7. While preaching was the main thrust of Jesus' ministry, the reason that He came, that's not all that He did, of course. He also performed signs, miracles. What's so important for us to recognize, however, is how the signs went along with what He was preaching at any given time. They weren't just miracles that happened out of nowhere. Jesus would often do a miracle to prove or to demonstrate or illustrate what He was preaching about. The signs were just that. They were signs. They pointed to the truth that Jesus proclaimed. In the story in the first ten verses of chapter 7 that we looked at last week, Jesus demonstrated that the poor who know they have nothing to give to God to gain His mercy and so are completely dependent on Him are the ones who are truly blessed by God and receive His mercy. The next miracle today in chapter 7 demonstrates just how far the power Jesus has to save those who have nothing truly goes. In fact, no miracle Jesus did makes the reach of His power more clear than when He raised people literally from the dead. He is the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophetic hope, and with Him, the age of the Messiah, the age of the kingdom has dawned. Jesus reveals that the Creator has come in the flesh to recreate His fallen creatures, to bring them back from death to life. He does that physically so that we know He has the power to do it spiritually. This is what is possible now that the Lord walks among us. And so as we look at this text, the question before us this morning is this, am I within the reach of Jesus? Where I am in my life, am I too far away? Can He get to where I am? That is what Jesus wants to show us in this miracle, that if the grave is within the reach of His power, then we certainly are also. The power of Jesus' Word reaches even into the grave to bring the dead to life. Let's pray. Father, I thank You for Your Word. I thank You, God, that You are the truth, that You are life and light. God, I pray that You would open all of our hearts to receive the truth of this passage, to receive Christ for us in this passage. I pray that You would soften us, that You would break up heart and clay with the light of Your Word, and that You would bring the dead to life in this place. We ask in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Verse 11 of chapter 7. Soon afterward, He went to a town called Nain, and His disciples and a great crowd went with Him. As He drew near to the gate of the town, behold, a man who had died was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. And a considerable crowd from the town was with her. And when the Lord saw her, He had compassion on her and said to her, Do not weep. Then He came up and touched the buyer, and the bearer stood still. And He said, Young man, I say to you, arise. And the dead man sat up and began to speak. And Jesus gave him to his mother. Fear seized them all. And they glorified God, saying, A great prophet has arisen among us, and God has visited His people. And this report about him spread through the whole of Judea and all the surrounding country. Capernaum, where Jesus had healed the centurion's servant, was on the northwest shore of the Sea of Galilee. But here, soon afterward, it says in verse 11, Jesus is in Nain, which is about six miles southeast of Nazareth. This episode will do what they've been doing. It will emphasize the sufficiency and authority of just the very word of Jesus. But even more than that, we meet a widow here who experiences the reach of that power, of Jesus' power. Just how powerful is the word of this Jesus? How far can it go? What can it get to? A funeral is in process when Jesus and his followers arrive in Nain, to be carried out to the place of the burial or to the tomb. The procession is coming out of the town gate, and all funerals are sad. They all are, but this one even more so, in a sense. Luke tells us that the dead man was the only son of his mother and that she was a widow in verse 12. So not only did she no longer have a husband, but now her only son, who was most certainly the source of all her support in this culture, had died. She faces much more than loneliness, which is awful enough. 
His death means almost certain poverty for her as well. We have to understand there were no social security payments to be had. There were no retirement accounts, no life insurance, no pensions. In a very real sense, her life had ended when her sons did. It's just that her existence continued. This is a dark day for the widow of Nain. But in verse 13, Jesus walks right into her sadness. Now, Jesus and those with him could have stood on the side of the road in quiet respect, allowed the procession to continue to show kindness. That is a very kind gesture. When my uh, grandfather died, it was shortly after I arrived here in Crossville, Tennessee, his funeral was in town, but uh, the burial, the cemetery was way out, as they would say, in the holler. I mean, it was, we drove about an hour from where the funeral home was to do the burial. And as we drove in the funeral procession, literally every car we passed pulled over. Some even got out of their cars and stood. A few would get out of their cars and stand and salute. This is uh, a wonderful gesture of respect and kindness and recognition for a grieving family, and it means a lot, but this is Jesus. Notice here, Jesus isn't asked to do anything. There's no indication of faith on the widow's part or anyone else grieving with her. Yet Jesus intervenes and does something for her anyway. So notice right away how different this scene is from the one we just read last week in verses 1 through 10. The centurion sent people to ask Jesus for help back in verse 3. And Jesus answered him in his mercy. Here, nothing is asked. Nothing is expected. There's no show of anything recognizes Jesus whatsoever. The question is, does that keep him from showing mercy? Does that render his word ineffective or impotent? If every benefit or kindness God ever showed to us depended on our faith or on our prayers, just how poor would we really be? We all know times and things that God has done without our asking. We're learning something very powerful about faith in a passage where faith is not present. Faith is not this force we have that gives Jesus the power or the desire to act. Jesus is Jesus, with or without faith. Now, we must have faith in Christ to be saved. Yes, we must believe in Him and put our faith in Him. But this scene is showing us something about what's really going on when it comes to Jesus. God is not limited by our spiritual deficiencies. And He isn't empowered by our prowess or strength or desire. He gives us what we need to be well. The power is His. The need is ours. It's not that Jesus isn't Jesus until we show up and do something or have something or give something. Ultimately, we're learning here that the healings Jesus did were not dependent on the faith of the person being healed as though He couldn't do it without it. He was weakened by it. It depends, everything Jesus does depends ultimately on His power and His might and His desire. Jesus wants to demonstrate the reach of His power, the true extent of who He is and what He has come to do. So He goes to the place that, as far as we're concerned, is too late. It's too late for the healer to do anything. And He goes to the place where the need is too great to have any faith. Many of us have been there. You don't have anything else to give. All hope is lost here. All the lights have gone out. Her son is dead. There's no greater example of how to receive the mercy of Jesus. We must be utterly bankrupt of even the thought of offering any assistance. He doesn't need it. He doesn't require it. He doesn't want it. What does Jesus do when I have nothing? What can Jesus do when it's too late? Verse 13. And when the Lord saw her, He had compassion on her and said to her, Do not weep. So at least 
in this story? What does Jesus have when we have nothing? Compassion. Compassion. Interestingly, very interestingly, this is the first time in the text of Luke, so far in these seven chapters, where he refers to Jesus as Lord. This is the first time the narrator does that in the Gospel of Luke. The Lord. That's who this is, the God who is and who was and who is to come. The Lord is filled with compassion for this woman in her loss and in her grief. The compassion of Jesus, then, is the motive for this miracle. Nothing else. Just His compassion. When Jesus comes doing miracles, then, it shows that the inbreaking reign of the Messiah is a reign of grace and of compassion. Miracles testify to the presence of God for salvation. The one doing these things can save us. Do not weep. Now, if Jesus can't do anything about the reason she's weeping, that's a cruel and callous thing to say to someone during a funeral. And for some reason, we say as human beings some of the dumbest, most callous things when we're at a funeral. We don't intend to. We don't mean to. Our hearts are often, as they say, in the right place, if that's even spiritually possible. We just like to say it. But so often in trying to help, we can say things that aren't really helpful at all because from us, they're just things to say. I, I, I will never... I, I remember most of the faces of the people that came to my little brother's funeral. He died when he was 10. This is 1994. I'm almost 30 years past that this June. Do you know what I really remember about that service? Are some of the horrible, well-meaning things people said in line to my parents while I stood there. It's just, just, we don't always have to speak because we can't really do anything. We can't really do anything. We can't make it better. So for Jesus to just say, do not weep, if He can't do anything about it, that doesn't help anybody. But He can. And He does, immediately. Touching this dead man's stretcher, by the way, makes Jesus ritually unclean, technically speaking, according to the law. But that doesn't matter anymore. Because now Jesus cleanses what He touches that is unclean. It doesn't contaminate Him. He purifies he cleanses. So don't worry about Jesus touching you. It's not going to make him dirty. It's going to make you clean. So come. Jesus' purity is greater than our contamination. Note that once more the transforming work here occurs simply at the word of Jesus in verse 14. That's all it takes. Young man, I say to you, arise. I say, Say to you, he's talking to a dead person, arise. What happens? Well, in Luke, if we didn't have, if we didn't know the story, now we all do probably, but in Luke and for most of his readers, they don't know what's going to happen now. They haven't seen this yet in Luke's gospel. We don't know if Jesus can do this yet. The raising of this widow's son comes at a crossroads in Luke because you have to take note of what happens next. A resurrection is the only kind of prophetic miracle that Jesus hasn't done yet in Luke. It's also the ultimate statement that He is indeed the final prophet. He's the one who has come at the end of the ages. He is the Messiah. This miracle, a resurrection of someone who is dead, proves this finally. And the fact that the miracle comes just before Jesus will send word back to John the Baptist who asks, are you the one or should we look for another? It's very conveniently here in Luke that he does it. I've checked all the boxes of who this end time prophet is. I am the one. You don't need to keep looking. The authority of the Messiah will extend over all creation, even the grave. Is Jesus the one or not? Whether or not he can do this is what says it definitively. And verse 14, Then he came up and touched the buyer, and the bearer stood still. And he said, Young man, I say to you, arise. And the dead man sat up and began to speak, and Jesus gave him to his mother. Yes, he is the one. 
It's him. The centurion was right back in verse 7, wasn't he? But say the word. That's all we need Jesus to do. No matter how far away we are, we could be in the grave, spiritually speaking, physically speaking, one day. When he speaks, the dead come to life. That's the true extent of just what the word of Jesus does. It's one thing in verses 1 through 10 to restore a man who um, is at the point of death, right? It's another thing entirely to raise one who has already died. Jesus can literally keep people from dying. That's wonderful. But what about when the Grim Reaper has already visited? So we do need to see verses 1 and 10 and verses 11 through 17 together so that we realize Jesus not only keeps one from death, but has the power to restore even when death has already done its worst. We cannot let the significance of this canceled funeral go unnoticed. This miracle tells us that even death is within the reach of Jesus' power if He chooses. Even death. Being dead doesn't keep you from Jesus' power. It doesn't put you beyond the reach or the sound of His voice. It puts you beyond the reach of everyone else's, even the ones that love you the very most and deepest, but not His. Nobody loves like Jesus. This miracle is really an acted out parable of what Jesus is going to do at the end of all things at His second coming when He raises up all those who have died in the Lord before that day, first, before anyone else. We might ask, why doesn't he do that now for the same reason he didn't do it then? It's just not time yet. Clearly, he can do it. That's 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18. But that day will come. That will happen. Jesus restored some people to life while he walked on the earth, but he didn't go around emptying cemeteries. These episodes, like the one at Nain, were clues, they're pointers of what is yet to come. What does His coming really mean? Not just for the 33 years or so that He was here, but for all human history. What does this moment say about the end of time, about the end of all things? For those who die in Christ, as they're called in 1 Thessalonians, the dead in Christ are just that. They're still united to Him. And at the sound of His voice on the final day, they will come out of the grave to be united with Him in the air as He's coming down to the earth. And then we who are alive and remain, if we're in that number, will be caught up with them in the air. What happened at Nain does not take away the misery or the sadness of death for us. But it may take away the horror of it. Maybe the despair that destroys us. Maybe it can take that away. Because we know that death doesn't have the last word over anybody, actually. The coming of Jesus means death is simply not the final word. Verse 16. Fear sees them all and they glorify God saying, a great prophet has arisen among us and God has visited His people. I bet they were afraid. That would have been terrifying and shocking. By this point, it's known to everyone around them that this man is actually dead. Right? Enough time has passed. They're carrying him out for his burial. He's dead. And here he is alive. This would throw you for a loop. He's a great prophet indeed, but he's also much more than that. This episode now, it brings to mind Two other miracles from the Old Testament, actually. In 1 Kings 17, 17-24, and 2 Kings 4, 8-37, in which, through the prayers of the prophets Elijah and Elisha, respectively there, two other sons were raised to life. Now, in Nain, the Elisha incident from 2 Kings 4 seems especially relevant. Elisha's miracle, all those years before, occurred in a place called Shunem, which is on the south side of the hill of Moreh, at the end of the plain of Esdraelon. Nain sits on the north side of that hill, about two miles from Shunem. 
So I wonder if anyone remembered or had heard about what happened just over the hill some 800 years earlier. But it's not apples to apples. The Nain episode is a little bit unique. In both the Elijah and Elisha episodes, the son's life was restored in answer to the earnest prayers and work of the prophet. There's nothing wrong with that. But at Nain, there's something more. Jesus doesn't pray. He commands the young man to come to life. This is not just a prophet. This is the prophet. He commands a dead son to live, and he lives. What is Jesus doing here? He's showing us this is the one who we don't even know how many years before said, let there be light. And do you know what there was? Light. Just say the word. Genesis 1-3. Let there be light. And there was light. This is a prophet. But he's far more than just a prophet. He speaks life into being. And we're trying to do that as humanity. Literally. Right? We're... We can do, I mean, AI, have you looked into this stuff? Artificial intelligence and what can be created? It's fascinating. I don't know if it's good, but it is fascinating. We're trying really hard to create life and command life. And I suppose if we have tons of money and tons of raw materials and tons of scientists, we can pull it off. Tons of effort, tons of work, tons of sweat, tons of thinking of genuinely amazingly smart, intelligent people. I'm not taking anything away from those that have the intellectual capacity to do such a thing, but why can't you just say the word? Because only Jesus is Jesus. Only Jesus has that level of authority. He can't not only create life out of nothing, He can conquer death with His word. We're both of those things. Spiritually, right? We don't have the power to raise ourselves. We don't have it within us to give what is needed in order to be made alive again. Once we're dead, it's done. And the Bible is clear that dead is what we are spiritually. So how are we going to get to Jesus when we can't actually even do the one thing that he says we must do, and that's believe. We aren't doing that without the gift of faith. We need these stories. It's not so much that Jesus came to perform the miracle of raising people from the dead. It's that he came to bring the power of death to nothing and offer to everyone the gift of resurrection and eternal life. If he can raise the physically dead, the spiritually dead are not an obstacle to his power. Because if Jesus is only a miracle worker and a teacher, if that's all He is, the result would be for us a theology of glory. We could join Him in fixing the world. We could contribute something. Because the sole purpose He came is in that understanding. If He's just a miracle worker and teacher and the best at it, then finally we have the one that can alleviate human suffering. And we can join with Him and help Him in that and we might conceptualize of our relationship with God as helping Him heal the world if all Jesus was is a miracle worker and a teacher. And that's what we should be too. We can help make the world a better place. It's only when we understand, however, there's an element, when we think like that, there's an element of the story of Jesus that we aren't taking into account. He is a miracle worker. He is the greatest teacher that ever lived. But He must also suffer rejection as that Lord on the earth. To the point of crucifixion and His own death. It's only then that we're able to take on the theology of the cross that Jesus was preaching in Luke 6 in the Sermon on the Plain. We need resurrected, not merely assisted. We are dead. We're being carried out. Jesus didn't come to give us a push to make us realize our best and become our best selves. 
That'd be nothing to brag about. Would accomplish nothing before God. Each one of us this morning is meant to infer that since Jesus has power to raise a widow's son or Jairus' daughter or Lazarus and even himself, then he also has the power to raise me from the dead. That's what I need to get from this story. That I am dead and he can raise me if he says the word. And that for me to live after that will always require that word keeping me alive. Faith will never stop being a gift from God. There will never be a moment where I'm holding even a part of my salvation. The grave is also within the reach of His power. And so this morning you do realize, don't you, that wherever you are, wherever it is that you're hiding, wherever it is that you're keeping the truth about yourself locked away, whatever it is that you've chosen to build your life on, you're still within the reach of Jesus. His reach will always be greater than your desire to get away from Him. His arm will always be longer than you can run, farther than you can get. His grace will always be greater than your sin. Whether you've never received Him as your Savior, or no matter how long you walk with Him, you just won't rest in His promise to you, you are never outside His reach. He raises the dead. What scenario is there that's more impossible to come back from? Where are we more hopeless than we are in the grave. And God tells us that we are dead in the grave in trespasses and sins. We were all stillborn, spiritually speaking. Every one of us in our transgressions. Ephesians 2 rolls it out on a platter for us. But Jesus has come to town. Jesus is standing here this morning as all us dead people are rolled by And all we need for Him is to say the word. And here's the thing. It has been said. That word has been said. He's lived the life required of us that we cannot live. Of perfect obedience to God. Of never sinning. Never cutting corners. Never doing anything evil. Ever. That's actually what God requires in the law. Perfection. Well, Jesus did it. We're saved not when we want to be perfect. We're saved when His perfection is credited to us as though it's ours. All we need for Jesus to reach us is to say the word, and it's been said. He's lived the life required of us that we couldn't live. He's gone to the cross to offer up that life for the forgiveness of our sins. It's in His death, in the pouring out of His blood, that that perfect life becomes applicable to me. When the sacrifice that would atone for my sins has been offered up of the truly spotless Lamb, now who He is and what He is is mine for the receiving, yours for the receiving. His for the keeping. But He also rose from the dead. God raised Him from the dead. Not just because He was perfect, but because, as the book of Acts says, it was not possible for death to hold Jesus in the grave. It's Jesus. Everything that makes the Word of Jesus reach me has been done and has been said. And it is yours for the receiving this morning. You are within the reach of Jesus. So rest in Christ.